Welcome, everyone. This is Kevin from the Yield Lab podcast. If you're new here, every week we invite fascinating guests to cover the topics of investing, entrepreneurship, and well being. Our guest today is Felix Moreno de la Cova, previous CFO at Zappo, a Bitcoin vault company founded by Vences Casares, who brought Bitcoin to Silicon Valley in 2012. Before that, you were a trader for more than 15 years, and you're now a farmer actually a real farmer in the south of Spain, not a yield farmer. And last but not least, you are an economist with a deep passion for the history and the evolution of money from barter once upon a time to precious metals, to fiat currencies, to e-gold, to Bitcoin today. In this episode, we'll talk about how we talk about the history of uh, and the evolution of money. We'll talk about the secrets of trading. We'll talk about the regulations, and last but not least, we'll talk about freedom of speech. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification to never miss one episode. Also, keep in mind, of course, as usual, that nothing shared or discussed here is financial advice. And now that we've covered the basics, on to today's episode. Felix, this is a special one because you're the person who first got me into Bitcoin. So yeah, so first, happy. So first, <laughs> happy 2000, so first in 2014, when I was yeah, doing a master's, there was this, this person who came at the end of an entire week that we had on Bitcoin, who was called Felix, was a bit of a of an arrogant person, I thought back then, and who would just talk about the, this, this Bitcoin thing that basically no one believed in the classroom, even after one entire week of studying the subject. And you basically ended this one hour session by saying Bitcoin is a new internet. And, and four years later, when I started to really get interested, you're the first person that I came to see basically back to Madrid to understand where to start in this, in this fascinating and very wide industry. So Felix, I'd like to start with a bit of context about you. What are the key turning points that led you to be who you are today? That's very broad, but I'll tell you what got me into Bitcoin. I've always been very interested in economic history and monetary history. I've, and I've followed the story of money from the beginning. I've read a lot on the subject and I was always very disappointed with the current fiat system we have. And before Bitcoin came around, I was very much into gold and digital gold currencies. There was a sort of golden age of digital gold currencies back in 2007, 2008. We had e-gold, e-bullion, gold money, a bunch of projects. All of them failed. And But before they failed, I learned about Bitcoin. And, and when they failed, I saw how Bitcoin could survive, what had taken down e-gold and gold money and so on. And I decided to learn more about it and started reading up. I was very skeptical initially because I thought this is based on nothing. There's no, nothing you can touch. There's nothing material. There's no physical, tangible thing that's backing it. And um, But then I realized after a long time and being very skeptical, very long, that there's actually a strength to that because it's a pure digital asset. Whereas if you make a digital gold currency, for example, you always need to rely on a third party to back it. You need a company, you need a government, you need someone to ensure that the promise to each unit, each gram of gold online is actually backed by a gram of gold in the real world. And it's very hard to check on that. You can do all the audits mm. you want, but but it's very easy to falsify. And also it's very easy to take down the company that's doing it. Whereas Bitcoin, by being completely decentralized and being open source and being transparent, it's taken a lot longer for it to gain value, to monetize. It also has a disadvantage of not having 5,000 years of history behind it. But it's so interesting how it's evolving very much in the same way the internet did to, to millions and then hundreds of millions of users and hopefully billions soon. So what does it mean when you said that these e-gold projects failed? Were people kind of buying some kind of digital asset but backed by gold somewhere, but then the thing went to zero, like people lost money? How, how did it happen, basically? No, what well, happened? Well, actually, each, each of them failed for a different reason. For instance, e-gold was taken down by the government. It was set up by a guy from Florida, and basically the FBI came up to him after he got to about 6 million users, which was a lot at the time before we knew Bitcoin. They came up to him and accused him of all kinds of things, money laundering, the usual, whatever, and he had to shut down the company. He And eventually he settled out of court, never went to prison, never did anything beyond home arrest. The project was ended. In the case of gold money, for example, the lawyers basically told them, hey, this is this is dangerous. 
the US regulators are going to come after us? Is it worth it for us as a company to do this when we make most of our money with investors? And why do we care about payments? So they took it down preemptively. In the case of some others, smaller ones like eBullion and so on, the true rug pulls. So like the owners actually run away with the money or in, in one famous case, there was even, I don't know, the lover of one of the founders killed someone. I don't know. But each of them was taken down in a different way. But all of them had one thing in common. You had to rely on a company to ensure the backing. So once that company went away, in some cases, the money was recovered. In the case of eGold, even after the, there was a trial and, and there was a liquidation authority that covered the company and uh, all the money was there, all the gold was there, all the, I had a tiny amount yeah. there, but I actually got it all back and more because the price of gold had gone up in the years that it took for the court case to resolve. Some of them were scammers, some of them were not, some of them are honest, but they all had the same problem. They were centralized. And that's why I'm so interested in Bitcoin and so interested in self-custody of Bitcoin and in decentralized exchanges as well. Okay, awesome. So before I'm talking about kind of gold and Bitcoin, let's talk about the basics you are an economist at heart. You wrote The Blondie Economist to explain economics simply. So let's start with the, some economics and basically the concept, the history, and the evolution of money. Why? Because that's the most important thing to understand regarding Bitcoin, basically. Most people think it's this weird kind of online gambling money. or But the people who really understand why this is so important are actually economists who have a certain who have a certain a deep understanding of how money evolves so let's start with that so people can really understand why bitcoin exists and why it makes so much sense so first what is money yeah, so the key point about bitcoin is scarcity just the same as it was for gold with gold you depended on supply but also gold reserves but also on new supply coming from mining but the growth of that supply was very small typically between a one and a half and two percent a year and more importantly, it was beyond the control of politicians and monetary authorities, who, after all, the job, despite all the rhetoric and all the propaganda, the job is to serve their masters. In the case of the US dollar, for example, the goal of the US Federal Reserve, they're always talking about the mandate, the dual mandate, mm. keep inflation low and keep unemployment low. But the real mandate, the hidden mandate, is finance the US government by US treasuries. Finance when it was created very shortly afterwards, it was used to finance the First World War. Like, so can, can, that, that's a real mandate. And that happens. It's easy to understand that anyone can get into the mind of the central banker who's been placed there by a politician. Whose phone is he going to pick up? He's going to pick up the phone of the politician on whose, whose his job depends on. And, and they're going to try and help those politicians. And the first thing, now that we have the, another U.S. debt crisis with the debt ceiling approaching, the first thing that they want is, please monetize our debt. But to keep it short, they because that is their priority, they will always print more than is advised by what the economy is needed. And obviously, you know about the Cantillon effect and how those who get the newly printed money first benefit from it and those who get it last push by it. And it's harder to see in developed countries like the US because the rhythm is slow. They've managed to keep the scam, let's call it that, because it's what it is, this scam at a tolerable level, 2% inflation, whatever. So people have the savings diluted very slowly. But you can see very clearly in countries like Argentina or Turkey or Nigeria, where inflation is in the double digits and sometimes triple digits, or Venezuela, or Zimbabwe, back when Gideon Gono was printing those trillion dollar bills, Zimbabwe dollars, of course. There you see the Cantillon effect very raw. The guy who gets the money today is at a huge advantage compared to the guy who gets the money a month from now. And they can profit very easily from it. And, and that but that all goes back to who controls it. Is it a level playing field for everyone where the rules are the same for everyone? No. With fiat money, the rules are different from the people close to power than from the people who are not. So where does this come from? Basically, you talk about financing the First World War, but it actually comes from a long time before. 
So if we look at the history of money, can we basically talk about this concept of hard sound money, talk about the Mississippi bubble, talk about the French Revolution, so people can understand Uh, that this thing already exists since a very long time. And basically, we go through the kind of history, the history, maybe from people were just barred. book. There's a lovely book called 40 Centuries of Price Controls, How Not to Fight Inflation. And and it goes back to the Babylonians. The the Code of Hammurabi, almost 5,000 years, sorry, yeah, 5,000 years ago, has has price controls in it because they're having problems with inflation. But since we don't have that much data on that, we have much closer examples, for example, from the Roman Empire when they started debasing the currency. We actually have a perfect chart because there's so many... Roman coins from different uh, centuries that have been collected, you can see the silver content in the denarius and how it was reduced slowly at first and then very quickly up until the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. And a big part of that was the emperors were out of money to pay the legions, as simple as that. So they started counterfeiting, they started debasing the currency, and that obviously led to price rises, to inflation. Inflation is first and foremost a monetary phenomenon. It's more complicated than that, but that's the biggest effect. If you debase the money, which nowadays is done by money printing, back in the day it was done by taking 10 denarius coins and using the silver to make 15 with less silver in Mm -hmm. them, and in fact, there's, there's the Edict on Maximum Prices by Diocletian, a Roman emperor who had to put in price controls because he was the base in the currency. So people were ra- raising prices to counteract that effect. And uh, you, he had to put the you, death sentence on people who were doing that. Can you explain this in, as, I mean, in an easy fashion, easier fashion, if you were talking to your mother, for example? So maybe you give us an example. You say, okay, I'm a Roman emperor and I'm running out of money because I'm spending too much. So then what I do is I, deb- what does that mean? I debase the currency. I the create basically debt, means, debt. Say you ha- I have 10 gold coins and to use easy numbers, one gram of gold each. And I take those 10 gold coins. I melt them. I, I make 20 coins with half a gram each. That's the basement. I mix it with some base metal like bronze or whatever, or copper, sorry. And, and then I have 20 coins with half a gram of gold each and some copper, which is cheaper, but, obviously. But I, take, and but I still I, tell people that it's still the same value as before. Exactly. I exactly. tell them this is still <laughs> worth the same as before, but the people are not stupid. They're going to weigh it. They can tell, look, they can bite it and say, look, this doesn't have as much gold. So I'm going to ask you to pay more. For, and even if they don't, they soon realize that since there's more coins to go around to buy the same amount of goods, necessarily, once you get into a bidding war, if we can do the thought experiment very easily, obviously the modern economy is more complex and there's velocity of money and there's all kinds of things. But if we keep it simple, we can understand the basics, which is if I go to the market and there's 10 chickens to be bought and there's only 10 gold coins in the entire market and we're all going to buy, eventually I might pay a bit more for one and then less for another, but eventually the 10 chickens are going to be sold for one gold coin each. But if there's 20 gold coins and all the chickens have to be sold on that day. Eventually, the chickens are going to be sold for an average of two gold coins each. And of course, maybe the first person to arrive doesn't know there's more coins there. So he's going to buy the chicken for the price of last day, right? He's going to pay one gold coin. But once the seller of chickens is running out, he says, oh, look, I only have two, two chickens left. And there's four guys trying to buy from me. And they all have, and they're showing me their gold coins. I'm going to sell it to the highest bidder. I'm going to say sell it to the guy to the guy who pays more. And obviously, in the limit, this is like a game theory thing. In the limit, eventually, all the coins are going to be spent, all the chickens are, to be, are going to be sold, and the average price is going to be twice as much. And we see this with we saw the money printing over the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Mm-hmm. We've seen the inflation that's followed shortly afterwards, and we've yeah. seen inflation ten percent up and so on. And uh, which, by the way, is a cumulative effect. So it, maybe so, it's not over. So what would happen? But there's, be- but, there's, but there's a whole industry built around lying to us about this <laughs> because because the people who are in on the scam don't want the rest of the people to know. They're profiting. So they want to get to the market with one new gold coin and buy one chicken before people realize that there's more money to go around. So... As a kind of recap of what was done already a long time ago is basically the Roman emperors or someone would just say, 
oh, I can kind of create money out of thin air <coughs> by by basically saying, okay, a, a gold coin is not worth one gram anymore is 0 0.5, but telling people it's still worth the same, but people will realize, so we'll ask for more. One that are selling basically will ask for more. And so they what happens- eventually, it's a process. They don't yeah. notice so, when and, the market opens. They notice over time. Yeah. So this is what we call basically inflation, which the more you do this kind of money printing or like fake debt creation, the more there is this inflation. And what you said before is, that to pre they had at some point to prevent, I guess, the merchants to increase their prices with this price control that you told, talked about. And that basically they would say, okay. Yeah, price controls are a consequence of inflation. So the first day, the, there's 10 coins in the market, right? So people buy the 10 chickens, one coin each. The second day, there's 20 coins. People start buying at one coin each. But by the end of the day, they have to spend all the coins. They have to buy all the chickens. It's two coins each on average. And then the third day, the emperor comes along to the market and people try to sell him chickens at two coins. And he said, no, what are you doing? The price two days ago was one coin. Why are you trying to sell me chickens for two coins or even three coins if they're trying to play it safe? He said, no, this is not allowed. And obviously the, and people are complaining and we have to, people complain about inflation. Then they say to politicians, you have to do something about it. And the politicians say, oh, it's greedy merchants. They're trying to get more money for their chickens. And they try to blame anyone but themselves. There's a lovely book about inflation. There's always economic fight about the definition of inflation. The old definition that was accepted by everyone was that inflation was an increase in the amount of money, the quantity of money. But over time, that's been changed. And nowadays, most economists accept the new definition, which was changed for propaganda purposes, obviously, that inflation is an increase in the price of goods. But that's a consequence of the increase in the amount of money over the whole economy, obviously. There's localized effects that can be different. And we nowadays, most people who use inflation, most journalists, even most economists use inflation as a synonym for CPI. Yeah. CPI is a really bad measure of inflation because it's it's only a select basket of goods. It's a very small basket of goods that doesn't include anything. And the whole point about money is that it's fungible. It can go anywhere. It doesn't have to go into that small basket of goods that some economists are measuring. It can easily go elsewhere. It can go to housing. It can go to stocks. It can go to commodities that are not in the basket. All those, all these tricks have been made to confuse the common public about what the cause of inflation is, because politicians don't want to be blamed, obviously. Even in places like Argentina, where the money printing is so fast and so obvious, and the inflation is so easy to see on a daily basis. Politicians still say, oh, no, no, it's because of other reasons. It's because of the balance of trade. It's because of the sanctions. It's because of the evil speculators. It's because they have a million guilty parties, but they will never look to the central bank and to the money printing. They don't want to. There's a lovely book, The Fiat Money Inflation in France. I made a documentary, a short documentary about, still on YouTube, I think, about inflation in the French Revolution. And it's very interesting because there's two there's two episodes. There's the French Revolution and the Mississippi bubble. But the yeah, French is the most let's talk about that and, and let's talk about how it ends. What's probably the a logical question for most people is okay, you start printing money in the old time, one way or another, then you say, oh, I'm gonna do some sort of price control, maybe even threaten people to kill them if they increase prices. But if the thing gets out of control, how does it end? How did it end in the past? We can take these two examples. And how does it end today in these countries where the inflation basically is out of control? Always ends one of two ways. One is the collapse of the currency. People stop trusting the money. And once they stop trusting the money, they, it goes even faster than the money because people don't even want it anymore, even if it should still be worth something because they haven't printed that much. Once confidence collapses, the value of money disappears. And the second way it ends is when they stop printing and they do, well, Paul Volcker is a recent example. In the 80s, he raised interest rates a lot. He fought inflation as much as he could, and he managed to stabilize it. But it led to a big recession. It led to falling prices. It led to, sorry, not falling prices. He only slowed down inflation, but it led to it led to a lot of unemployment and an economic crisis. So it was tough medicine. Most people, Paul Volcker is not a hero to that many. Whereas Ben Bernanke, for example, yeah. he got the Nobel Prize, is got to be on the front page of Time magazine as a hero who rescued the US economy. So printing normally pays quite well 
for the people who do it. They are seen as the heroes. They're not seen as the... And stopping that printing has been done sometimes in history. One good example is Austria. Austria had a hyperinflation in the 1920s after the First World War. Same as Germany, but they managed to stop it. And they did two ways. They stopped printing, advised in part by Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian economist at the time. And they also cut off all the currency that was coming in from the rest of the Austrian Empire. The Austrian Empire collapsed and uh, Austria was left as a small nation. But the currency was worth, was used in all the empire. So they basically had to stamp the Austrian shillings, I think it was, the shilling notes with a thing, with a little stamp that said Austrian shillings for Austria. <laughs> and they stopped accepting Austrian shillings coming from Croatia, from Hungary, from all other countries. But they stopped it. They stopped it. Okay, so do you want to go maybe through one of these two examples of French Revolution or Mississippi bubble just and then make the link to like how money evolved after that and to Bitcoin. And then we do for this chapter a recap on why basically Bitcoin. You started before to say that, but like talk about one of these two examples, Mississippi bubble or French Revolution, and then sure. we go Bitcoin, why it makes the, the sense. The Mississippi bubble was a very early example in Europe of money printing, but it's the less interesting case. There was a huge bubble, it collapsed, people lost a lot of money, France was in crisis, in shock and so on. John Law was the villain of the story, but it's much more interesting what happened in the French Revolution because they had the experience of the Mississippi bubble. They remember there were people alive in the French parliament, in the, who, in the Assemblée Nationale, who remember the Mississippi bubble and they didn't want to print money because they remember the Mississippi bubble. But they were convinced, they were outnumbered by people who said, no, we're going to do it in a very controlled way. We're going to back the money with the goods confiscated from the church and we're going to do it just once, just to kickstart the economy. And of course, they did it and it worked because it did give the economy, call it fake, but it did give it a sort of impulse. And a lot of people, a lot of people made a lot of money like that because, you know, they got the newly printed money from the government and they went off and bought church properties with it. So they suddenly became big landowners when they, before they, they hadn't been. And a new class of speculators came to be. And of course, those people whose mode of life, his business, they pressured for more, of course. Once the money printing ran out, they wanted more. They wanted more and they convinced the Assemblée Nationale and they bribed the ministers and they got a second printing and then a third and then a fourth. And eventually, and it's a very illustrative case because it reminds me very much of QE and TARP. I don't know if you remember it in the great financial crisis was going to be a one-off thing. And then we got QE2 and QE3. And a bunch of people who done really well out of QE wanted more. And now it's yeah. gotten to the point where the markets are addicted to, to these kinds of stimulus, stimulus packages, and they're addicted to low rates. And now that we're seeing interest rates go up, it could be quite troublesome. There's a lot of this that aren't used to this. They're used to easy credit. Of course, back in the French Revolution, it was actually paper money. They actually had to print notes. Now it's just digital. So it's even harder to control. It's even harder to measure. So in a nutshell, after understanding being all the history of how money works and how certain, let's say, parties in the economy or stakeholders are incentivized to print money for their career and for their wealth, the reason why Bitcoin is because Bitcoin is scarce. There is only 21 million Bitcoin and it's decentralized. So there is no central entity that is able to change the economic policy of Bitcoin. Yeah, people talk about the social contract a lot, but the reality is that most of the laws we live under, we had no say in. We had no power to choose them or reject them. If you can't reject them, you haven't had a choice, have you? But Bitcoin is a, has, is a voluntary adoption of a social contract. We All the people who use Bitcoin agree that it should be 21 million. It should be limited. It should be scarce. And, and that's a very powerful thing. That's a very powerful idea. And that the rules are the same for everyone. Nobody gets an advantage. Nobody gets to make new Bitcoins. We, we, anyone can make them the same way. Nobody gets to make them and exclude others. 
And this is something that puts Bitcoin apart from other cryptocurrencies as well. There's no, there was a Bitcoin foundation. They never had any power over the, over the code, but they didn't last long. But there's an Ethereum foundation. There's uh, Ripple is a company. There's Polygon is a company. All these other, all, that that's what, but the reason that Bitcoin was able to do this was because nobody believed it in the beginning. Yeah. It was for a long time, for almost a year, it had no value. And only the value, at least no monetary value on the market, trade on the market. So Bitcoin really is special, really is different to all these other things. I don't know how could someone could make Bitcoin today, because the minute someone made it, everyone would know that there was a potential for it to become more valuable and they wouldn't treat it the same. They try to corner the, corner the market. They try many different strategies to profit from it. Whereas mm-hmm. Bitcoin had this sort of immaculate conception because people just, it was so new, people just didn't understand and didn't know it. Yeah. Great. Let's talk about trading because you've been trading, I think, for, you said, more than 20 years. And you've been trading pretty much every field, commodities, ethics, crypto. Let's no, start... Not more than 20 years. I'm not that old, but almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. <laughs> Yeah, so, I've, I, my one of my first jobs was in stocks. Then I've gone through commodities. I've gone through forex. Obviously, I've tried my hand at crypto trading. Not very successfully, I must say. It's a very <laughs> difficult market. And I've done almost everything except fixed income. And yeah, so what do you want to know about trading? What's the real game in trading that's happening behind the scenes that most retail traders ignore at their own peril? Let's talk about the Forex market, for example, because that's the one I've spent most time on. Most traders lose money. A large majority of traders lose money consistently. In fact, a large number, I don't know if it's 30 or 40 percent, burn out and lose everything in the first year. And Forex brokers just don't care. For them, it's like a casino. There's going to be a bunch of people who come in, lose all the money and leave. It's fine. Some new people will come in. So it's very difficult. But there's also a small percentage of people who work for companies who are hedging the for the for currency flows and so on. And they don't care about making money. They just care mm. about we're using this as a tool to hedge some other thing. And then there's a very small number of prop traders, I'd say less than 10% of total, who consistently make money. They have the best information they have. And I'm talking about in general. Obviously, if you have inside info from the Fed or the Bank of England or the European Central Bank, you have a lot easier, a much, much easier way of making money. What the Fed's going to do with rates before the rest of the market, you can make a killing. Let's imagine that doesn't happen that often. I wanted to say, I want to say, how much do you think this happens? Obviously it happens. But how much do you think it happens? Because there is it's supposed to be... A, in, in the law that is, that is forbidden. So how much do you think this is really happening? And who are the who are the people who benefit from that? I don't know for sure, but obviously the f- people with access to information first benefit. And uh, there's this lovely book about, about high-frequency trading called uh, The Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, talking about how these prop trading firms were paying for the collocation of the servers to be as close as possible to the exchanges, to the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and so on. But I, we want them to be next to the servers so that we have only a millisecond or less than a millisecond delay so that we get the prices first and we can front run the rest of the market. And these guys paid millions for that. That is something that people pay millions for to get a millisecond advantage or a less than a millisecond advantage on some markets where the information is quite public. They're just trying to be faster. Imagine those markets where the information is not public, like the Fed, the basically the centralized authorities that determine important things in the economy. There's a fact, there's a, an ETF that follows US politicians. Yeah, I would say there's a Nancy Pelosi portfolio tracker also on Twitter. Yeah, that's so funny. No, but they've actually made and, a, two ETFs, <laughs> one for the Republicans, one for the Democrats, because they do so much insider trading that and it's and no, nobody has gone to jail for insider trading in Congress. Nobody. And they but even that is like <laughs> the low level game for the insiders, because yeah. laws take a long time to develop. They have to be written. There's a bunch of lobbyists involved. You 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 have a lot of information leaking for months before the law is, is voted on. Even if Nancy Pelosi has bought, I don't know, NVIDIA shares or because they're going to ban Chinese chips or the other way around or whatever. That's a very slow game. Whereas the, the Fed decision, the FOMC decision on rates 
is something that's a sidling yeah. meeting and published on the same day. Inside information there is is worth much more than stuff on stocks and on laws. But who does it? I don't know who does it. I don't know anybody who does it but personally. Or but, they wouldn't uh, tell you. <laughs> they wouldn't tell me, but it stands to reason that the people closer to those who make the decision yeah. are the ones who have the opportunity. You said most people lose all their money in the first year of trading. Can you explain why? Is it because they're using leverage? Is it because they can't control their emotions? Is it a mix of that? Is it is there another reason? What should well, the, people the, who think the that they can rule... make money beside their job or maybe quit their job to become a full-time trader because they can do it remotely from anywhere? What should they understand about the truth of this and the reality of this, of all these well, the first, that are sold the first, online? The first rule and the hardest, if you want to survive as a trader, and the hardest rule to apply, I been the first one to break it in the past and regretted it obviously is is controlling your losses so what's it called yeah and stop loss and uh, and basically risk control so basically you never say you're doing forex to keep it simple you never risk more than one percent of your portfolio on one trade so if you have a stop loss and you know how much you can lose if you're wrong and that is not much than, more than 1% of your portfolio. Say you have a strategy. If you do risk control properly, if you control risk properly and you never lose more than 1% of your portfolio on a single trade, you have to be wrong 100 times to lose it all. Whereas most people who blow up, they, they basically double down. So they, they think they're right. So they make a trade bigger than they should. Then they're wrong. Then they double down and do twice the size to try. And, so you say, instead of doing... A 1% loss, say someone says, I'm really convinced about this, so I'm going to do up to 10% loss. And then they're wrong, and they lose 10% of their portfolio in one trade. Then emotions come in, and they, yeah, I have to recover this somehow. So they do double or triple, and, and they're wrong again, and they lose 30%. So now they've lost 40% of their portfolio in one day. And, that's, and then they start underwater, so now their psychology is all screwed up. They start innovating strategies. They start doing things wrong. And, they, and also because of leverage, it's very easy to bet on something with more money than you have. Some Forex platforms will give you 300 times leverage. <laughs> so basically, if the market moves 3%, you've lost everything. So it's risk control and is a very important part of it. That's the first rule. And then psychology is also important. You have to be very cold, cool, calm and collected to survive. So... As an experienced trader, what did you find out regarding trading Bitcoin in particular? I've never been able to make money trading Bitcoin. I've made money holding Bitcoin. I've never made any money trading it because it's so different. For instance, it went up almost 10% over the past 24 hours. Yeah. I always trade Bitcoin because I'm trying to learn. I do it with tiny amounts. I use a platform called LN Markets, which let, lets you trade with a thousand Satoshis. And I do it as a game to see if I can time the market. But I was long Bitcoin two days ago. I closed the position closed making what, a few thousand Satoshi. So like cents of not even $1. Mm -hmm. Just And then the moment I closed my position, the market went up by 10% and I would have made it. It's, you know, it's very hard to time Bitcoin. And I'm sure there's big whales who can move the market in the short term and so on. And who have access to better information than I have. But but. I think most of them, even most of them lose money. Even people doing simple things like arbitrage. So FTX, Alameda, the guys who blew up, were trying to do arbitrage between the US market and the Japanese market. Yeah. And that was the big strategy. They That's how they about. started. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure for the first few trades, they actually made money. And that's what they went with to investors to get funding. But, but the stra strategies don't last forever. So as soon as their strategy stopped working, but they realized that more money was coming in. That's when they turned into a Ponzi. That's I was a... watching the Madoff documentary the other day, and I was yes. amazed that Madoff never actually traded with his Ponzi. I, yes. I thought he did. I For a long time, I thought he he started trading and doing okay, but then realized the Ponzi was more profitable, but or crazy... lost money. And then, in fact, I think it did mention that his first fund blew up and he was bailed out by some big investors. And that's when he turned into a full Ponzi. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very a crazy difficult story. to find the Bitcoin market. I've never managed it and I've been trying for 10 years or more and I've never managed it. I think a key thing that you mentioned here is if you want to be a great trader, you need to develop strategies and these strategies basically will work for a couple of weeks maybe or one, two months. 
And then they will not work anymore because people will find out about the inefficiencies of the market and kind of close this gap. And then you will have to find a new strategy and you have to do this forever, basically, which is probably sure. very difficult or impossible. And, and that's why when you say I never made money, do you mean I never, I didn't, you actually lose money or you mean you are not beating just buying and holding the asset full disclosure i've done so like the past <laughs> hundred trades i've done on ln markets again with tiny amounts of money just as a game i've i've lost in 60 of them and profited in 40 of them so i'm down a few thousand satoshis but i keep trying because i want to learn but whereas in forex i consistently make Small amounts, but I make money, and yeah. I've been I've had a forex business for a long time. On Bitcoin, I've never managed it. Maybe I don't have the right strategy. I don't know. That's why I keep trying. But but I nobody learned from me because I don't make money trading Bitcoin. What are some potential explanations on why it's so difficult to trade Bitcoin? The potential. first one is still a relatively small market. Relatively, even though it's grown immensely, it's still relatively small market, and and it's very volatile, and there's. And it's so decentralized that the drivers of the market can come from anywhere. China banning Bitcoin, we've seen that 15 times. There's no way I'm going to, I could react quick, fast to that, but I'm sure there's guys with AI and high frequency trading yeah. algorithms that can pick up on the Chinese news faster than I can. Open markets are very competitive. Forex is very competitive as well. But if you focus on something like I do on Euro dollar, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit easier to stay on top of things. Yeah. Okay, great. I think uh, I think it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. It's extremely difficult to make money trading Bitcoin, if not impossible in the long term. I know a few guys who made a lot of money with the leverage and all that stuff, but they yeah. blew up many times before that. They learned and they probably also have the thing that most people don't have. And okay, interesting. Let's talk about regulations. So you were CFO at Zappo, which is a mm -hmm. Bitcoin vault company. And you witnessed firsthand the troubles that Bitcoin exchanges have with banks. So can you please develop a bit more about how hard the regulation make it for the industry to move forward? Or what's the actual problem? In the early days, it was just impossible for a Bitcoin exchange to get a bank account. Uh, it was too high risk. Everyone was scared because of the empty Gox collapse. It was also very hard for audit firms to audit the accounts because they didn't have people who understood what a private key was and you know how to how did they how could they possibly know if the Bitcoin was the exchanges or belonged to the clients or whatever. So it was a very risky business for banks and for not so much for banks, but they thought it was. And it was also very risky for auditors. And without audit, without audits, you don't get banks, etc. Now things are opening up a lot. Many banks do offer bank accounts, but they're still subject. The banking system, if you're treating in dollars, depends on corresponding banks. And corresponding banks are harsher than regulators. Because from time to time, they get a huge fine. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs have gotten, and Bank of America have gotten huge fines for money laundering and stuff like that. And, and from time to time, oh, JP Morgan pays a $6 billion fine for money laundering from the Mexican drug cartels. So yeah, but that's part they, of the business. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the business. They pay the fine. They don't give up the profits that they made with the business. But, but the regulators give them a slap from time to time. So they have very strong risk departments. And they basically put a risk on every customer, every transaction, every company. And... and Regulators hate Bitcoin because it's it's something very new. First, because it's something very new and they don't understand it. They have very few people who understand it at the regulators. Secondly, because they see it as a threat to national currencies. And that if you're the almighty dollar, that might not seem very, it might seem very far off. But if you're the Argentinian peso, it is a very real threat. You don't want people using the competitor. And basically regulators, the way they do it is instead of making a law, that says banks can't open Bitcoin bank accounts, they will just say, no, you have to label them as high risk. So if the bank's risk profile is already higher for whatever reason, they will just say, no, look, our risk department doesn't allow this. Our compliance department doesn't allow this. And in this is a very big risk because some companies, for example, stablecoin companies, we're seeing yeah, it this right week, now. Yes. Because it doesn't, you don't need to have a law to shut them off. All you need to do is make a call from the regulator to the banks and say, hey, why are you doing business with these guys? This is high risk. You could lose money. 
you're open to lawsuits, you're open to regulatory action, and then the guys will close the bank accounts. And if you're someone like, I don't know, Tether, for example, or Binance USD or whatever, <laughs> you need the bank accounts because, you know, the backing, we're back to the ego stuff. You need the company to prove the backing so that when someone comes and wants to convert the USDT or the BUSD to dollars in the bank account or to some other currency, they need the bank to do it. That's why I'm so interested in Bitcoin self-custody and building the Bitcoin circular economy where people yeah. earn Bitcoin and spend Bitcoin without having to go through the banking system. Because that's We're where you see the real power of this. You know, the banks are part of the fiat system and they are subject to the regulators and they're always going to fight against the competition. Some of them, like Silvergate Bank in the US, which is currently running into a lot of trouble, will try to be a bit more innovative but they're fighting against the tide. They're fighting against the current. So uh, this is the next topic. But just before moving on to that, why is it so with these regulations? Is it because the regulators are trying to protect the consumers? Let's say now what's happening because FTX, etc. Is it because of lobbies in the bank industry? Is it another reason? Is it a mix of different reasons? Like, why is this? The first reason would be fear of innovation. Especially in the European Union, we've seen that we've seen that with internet. They've done all these silly things like the make you make us all click to approve cookies and so on. When a technological solution would be much better than making every single website in the world have to have a pop-up, approve cookies, consent, so on. It's they've done really silly things. So first thing is lack of knowledge. They're ignorant. That's first. And I guess it pays to be conservative when you're ignorant, right? Something new comes along, it's scary, there's been a lot of scams, there's been a lot of things, you play it safe. So that's yeah. the first thing. The, the looking after themselves by playing it safe. So it's not this big conspiracy. When new regulations come along, like the case of Mika in, in the European Union, which is the markets in cryptocurrency, in crypto assets regulation, which keeps getting delayed, that's when the lobbies come in. And the lobbies, obviously, the people who are going to get, there was a request for feedback on some crypto regulation from the bank, from, sorry, on CBDCs from the European Central Bank. And I say, okay, I'm going to send them a note. But when you see all the requirements that they put up for the public to send them feedback, you uh, you, the real feedback they're getting is from the guys they meet every day, from the bankers some from the bank associations and from the other regulators and politicians. Then they don't talk to the public that much. And they definitely don't talk to tech companies unless it's giant. So first reason is the scared. Second reason is the lobbyists come in for new regulation and the first priority is to exclude competition. In yeah. the US, to be a Bitcoin business, and we saw this at Sapo, you have to get 50 money transmitter licenses, one for each state. Coinbase did that. And now that Coinbase has their 50 licenses, PayPal, even before Bitcoin, PayPal had to do that. They had a huge deal with the PayPal wars. There's some books on that. and uh, But now that Coinbase has all those licenses, they didn't want anyone else to get them. They could have the monopoly for Bitcoin in the US. So yeah. they are part of the bad guys now lobbying to make very restrictive regulations. And we're talking about exchanges, but uh, let's talk about Lightning Network. Anybody can get a Lightning address. We're seeing it now on Noster on the, this new social media website that's replacing Twitter. And everybody has a Lightning address. You can just click on the whole sap on the whole lightning icon and pay someone banks don't want that venmo doesn't want that paypal doesn't want that can you explain Nobody what this is the lightning network for people who don't know well, about it the lightning network is a layer two on top of bitcoin bitcoin is slow and expensive and its capacity for transmitting money is limited the, for the number of transactions is limited so if bitcoin is going to be used by billions of people you need something on layer two thanks thankfully Bitcoin is programmable so there's this thing called micro payment channels you can make some smart contracts on it not many but some and the simplest one is a micro payment channel and the lightning network was built using these building blocks of micro payment channels so that you can open channels to a network of people who already have channels open and you can make instant payments in bitcoin yeah. And, and it's quite well done because it's very decentralized as well. There's many centralized solutions for paying Bitcoin without having to make a Bitcoin transaction and registering it on the blockchain. But they are centralized solutions. You're trusting someone. 
Whereas in the Lightning Network, you, you don't have to. And the Lightning Network is very new. It was out in 2017 and it's still evolving. And one of the things that's evolving very fast is the UX, the user experience, because it was very difficult. You had to run a light. <coughs> you had to, for example, the way most people pay Lightning right now is with invoices. You create an invoice, which is basically a QR code or a very long string that asks for money. So people have to scan that QR code or copy that and paste that string and then see if the amount of money you are asking for is correct and then approve the payment and then make the payment. Lightning addresses, which are very new, like from this year, are much easier to use because they look just like an email address. It's I've got a couple of them, like one which is flix at cbd.gg. And then you can copy paste it anywhere. You can send it via WhatsApp. You can on Noster, Noster or Nostrich or however you pronounce it, (laughs) this Twitter-like social network, basically everyone puts a lightning address on their bio and you can pay them with one click. It's amazing. It's amazing. And anywhere in the world, because the problem with all these payment systems is that they're restricted geographically. You can't pay a guy in Africa with PayPal or Venmo. You can't. In Spain, we have this thing called Bisum which is basically like a bit like Venmo. All the banks are on it, but it only works in Spain. I can't send a Bethum to someone in France or to Portugal, which is next door. It's ridiculous. At least some apps like Revolut let you work in yeah. all of Europe. I don't know if it works in the US yet. They said they were going to launch there. But, uh, but Lightning doesn't have these restrictions. You can send to someone in Syria who's just suffered from the earthquake. Yeah. They're under OFAC sanctions. You can send a person there's someone on Twitter or Noster or whatever, you can, with one click, you can send them money. It's so easy and it works, it works for the whole world. There's still yeah. some kinks and some things to improve, but it's going so fast. It's moving so fast. I'm amazed. Plus, the, if you can use email, you can use a lightning address. It's so yeah. easy to use. You just need so- a wallet, which is an app. And then most wallets will give you, some wallets will give you a lightning address by default. So it's very easy to use. Still, I was reading yesterday some stats from Bitrefill, which is a company that allows people to buy a lot of stuff with Bitcoin and Lightning. And Lightning is only like 5% of their payments. So it's very new and most people don't use it yet. It's growing fast. A couple of years ago, it was non-existent. But I saw still, your post on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, more people use coin payments on Bitrefill. And we're talking about a website that does crypto online payments. We're not even talking about the street. We're not talking about the street and we're not talking about general payments. We're not talking about people buying, paying or on Airbnb or whatever. So yeah. we're talking about online and crypto. And yeah. even there, Lightning is only 5%. But it's so easy to use and it's growing so fast that I'm, and it has so few restrictions. You can use it anywhere in the world. You can do micro and nano payments. You can do one Satoshi. You can send people one Satoshi just to say hi. It's amazing. And uh, But yeah, but if you're a bank and you're making people do second factor authentication for every transaction and you, you don't want, you're already doing like Venmo and you don't like Revolut and these new yeah. banks or apps because they're competition for payments, but at least they are controlled and they're normally associated to a bank account. Yeah. But what are you going to think about someone not having to ask for permission to pay anywhere in the world instantly? No, banks don't like it. They, they, yeah. they eventually they will have to use it themselves but now they hate it so these Bitcoin- I mean, in, sorry just to be just to go a bit more on the point right now aml regulations means that any medium-sized transactions have to have some kind of compliance follow-up so that's What's a medium-sized transaction above three thousand dollars you have to do some kind of compliance above fifty thousand. you have to do a lot of compliance if you buy a house or something you're going to have to ask for funds a bunch of papers from the guy paying yeah. you have to have a very complete profile of the customer and that this is regular activity because otherwise the, <laughs> they're gonna it's gonna they're gonna have to file a suspicious activity report or something but that's a lot of work you can't automate that you need people on that so for banks it's very expensive to do this kind of thing and microtransactions they're just not interested, especially yeah. free microtransactions, free instant microtransactions. There's no way they can handle that kind of compliance burden. So they're not going to do it for a long time until they have the tools to do it. So they don't want anyone else doing it. As simple as that. So as a kind of summary, like some people say Bitcoin is freedom, Bitcoin is fungible freedom, which leads us to our last topic of today, which is freedom of speech. That you particularly love too, which is because it's also very linked to this this Bitcoin idea. 
and particularly in the social media world. So what are the key issues today regarding freedom of speech on centralized social media, such as Twitter? And maybe we can well, talk a bit about that, the, the work the that Elon thing. is doing. Yeah, that's the marvelous thing about Nostar. You don't have to ask the permission. It's decentralized. If you want to block something, you can block something for yourself, but you can't block it for other people. Or if you run a relay, you can... Okay, let's take a step back. I think freedom of speech is the foundational freedom, the foundation of democracy. It's the first amendment in the United States. It's the most important one. If you can't complain about the government doing evil things, if you can't talk to other people and, uh, and think about things, think out loud and debate and so on, then you don't have a democracy or anything like it. So because I think freedom of speech is so important, I've and because most speech nowadays doesn't happen on traditional media, but online, on social media, and most of it is trivial, right? People talk about football, about Lady Gaga, about Rihanna, whatever. And that's fine. That's part of freedom of speech. People are going to talk about, but a lot of people also talk about politics and what's going on in the world and all that stuff. And, and that debate, the moment you are on centralized social media, can be censored. And in fact, during the pandemic, we've seen a complete epidemic of censorship on all the major social media. Some topics were completely banned, got you blocked immediately on Twitter. And Twitter, for the very first few years of his existence, had no censorship whatsoever. Even of very evil things like terrorism and so on, it had no censorship. People just followed or whatever, but there was no, there was not there wasn't a team at Twitter censoring things. Now, censorship is quite strong, and I understand there's no way they can stop it, even with Elon, because they have advertisers, they have economic interests, they have they are touched by regulations, and the politicians nowadays are very keen on censoring speech, on censoring what they call misinformation and disinformation and so on, but which in many cases, the politicians are the first, the biggest liars and the first providers of misinformation, but obviously they're not going to censor themselves. They're going to censor the opposition or, what, or whatever, anything that's fringe. So I think it's, I've for a long time, I thought it's very important to create a decentralized social network that would allow dissidents in China, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, in Russia, anywhere to be able to have free speech so and you... twitter wasn't it and facebook wasn't it and instagram wasn't it and tiktok wasn't it and anything that's centrally controlled by a company or a government cannot be it by definition and i was quite i mean i've been following a number of projects there's all kinds of messaging apps that are more or less private a signal this matrix there's all this but i was thinking about the public arena the public debating ground and twitter was the closest thing there was to it until the pandemic and, uh, and now Nosta seems to be the closest thing there is to it. And even though it's very new, I think it has a chance to grow and to survive because of how it's built, because of the way it's decentralized. I think it has a chance to work even in places like Cuba and China and Russia, where censorship is very strong. It's really interesting that you mention it because Matteo is basically my co-founder on this podcast, who is taking care of the entire growth and distribution just created an account two or three days ago and was like, hey, I created this account on Nostr. We need to link all the video clips to that. So shout right. out to Matteo with an amazing job and who understood that this is the future of social media and where we're going to so have too. the biggest so growth. Too. But it's very early. Eh? If you look at most of the Nostr apps, you'll see they have 10,000 downloads. Twitter has, what, 200, 300 million users. We're still a long way off. And the usability still needs to be improved. It was only a few days ago that you could get, you could do zaps, micropayments on the Android client, on Amethyst and all of those. It's all very new. It's got to improve a lot, but it, I think it's got a chance. It's got a good chance. Also, I am amazed. I'm amazed. I'm not surprised. In the US, the First Amendment has always been sacrosanct, at least on paper, even though they've always tried to undermine it. But in Europe... I, you won't hear a single politician defending free speech. It's amazing. Unless they're in a very vulnerable position, they're in, in a minority, and they're the ones suffering censorship. And Europe, it's amazing. You go to Brussels, and all they talk about is we have to fight misinformation. We have to control speech online. They're, they're suing Twitter right now, even though Twitter is very censored, because they want direct control. 
over what people can tweet. They just, they, it's a very elitist, very aristocratic way of looking at things. So you don't want the plebs to be able to talk among the, amongst themselves, otherwise we'll have a revolution. It's, I don't know, it's, I'm hoping that NOSTA can survive even very strong attacks from regulators. Awesome. So the next one is basically, is very linked to this Bitcoiner mindset and this also freedom of speech mindset of kind of not trusting anything or kind of understanding the system. So it's basically, what's the, what's something that you believe in that most people would not agree with? The thing I find most trouble with is trying to promote Bitcoin self-custody. Nobody wants that. <laughs> Nobody wants to be responsible for their own It's true. private keys. Nobody It's wants to be responsible for their own backups. Everybody wants an app that's made by a company that yeah. makes things easy for them. Especially when the amount becomes bigger, you, you want to outsource this responsibility sure. because sure. it feels in, in terrible fact, I was talking to, to guy, that... I was talking to a guy from Hong Kong yesterday. I was trying to convince him because I'm very much into decentralized exchanges. I've been collaborating with BISC for a while. Network, it's the only real DEX that Bitcoin has. And I was talking to this guy from Hong Kong who was complaining about all the troubles that Binance is going through. And I say, why don't you try BISC? It's a decentralized exchange. And he says, no, because it's the responsibility. What if I lose money? And how are you going to lose money? But even if you do, you can lose money with Binance if they shut down or if they're doing FTX or an empty gox. Yeah, but if that happens, I can blame them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if I lose money with self-custody and with decentralized <laughs> exchange, the fault is mine. Yeah. So most people like that. Most people, Makes I mean, we are not used. We're after generations of keeping our money in the bank. Nobody's used to it. So it's a Bitcoin is very much an educational. It's not only educating people to be responsible for their own money. It's also educating them to save because number go up over the long term. And it's educating them about so many things, but it's very slow work. Very. And slow. I would even do that. I would even add to that, that people don't want to take the responsibility of owning their own money. That's why they use banks, but they also don't want to take the responsibility of investing their money. That's why they give it to the financial system who does a lot of different stuff, takes a lot of fees that compound over time that basically make you probably retire much later than you could if you were mm. doing it yourself. That's an entire other topic, but we don't sure. like no, to no, take no. responsibility, it's basically. It's a very good topic. Once you trust, you have trust as the third parties, they're going to want to cut. And it's fair in some it's instances, fair. but once they get people used to that, they, they will abuse it. And the yeah. only thing that's stopping <laughs> them from abusing it too much is competition. And that's why monopolies are so bad. So at least if a bank is scamming you with fees, you can say, hey, goodbye, I'm going to another bank, which is going to scam me, is promising that they're going to scam me a bit less. <laughs> but, but there's a monopoly, with, like with a central bank and with a currency, you have no choice. You're stuck yeah. in a very scammy system. And over time, the guys in charge realize this and will compound and will increase the amount that they take, will increase their rent, the amount that they extract. And that's inflation is just one way of doing it. There's other ways exactly. of doing it. I mean, there's but, Coming but back inflation full is a very a good one because <laughs> nobody understands it. Coming back full circle, basically. If there is a possibility to exploit the system people who have the power will do it yeah power corrupts so the, the yeah. way to to reduce that corruption is to reduce that power decentralize it yeah so if there was a summary or key takeaway which might be what you just said basically but you can repeat it or say something else if there was a summary or key takeaway that people should remember from today what would it be I'd, I'd recommend that people learn about Bitcoin, learn about self-custody, and also they learn about the Lightning Network and payments. I think once you've made a Lightning payment instantly to the other side of the world, there's no going back. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Felix. Where can the audience find you and connect with you? I'm on Twitter at Flix1, and I'm on Nosta, but I don't know how to share an <laughs> MPUB yet. So that's for the next time. We'll meet on Noster very soon. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Please smash the like button and give us your feedback in the comments. Highlights will be posted on YouTube, Twitter, Substack, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. So follow us and Noster. So follow us there to get exclusive access to the special content and promo codes. And I'll see you all in the next episode.
Thank you very much, Kevin.